Hello students, this is Professor Gore, and uh, in this lecture, um, is gonna, we're going to divide it up into three parts, and it's going to be covering urbanization. So I refer to it as the growth of cities because it helps you understand that um, with the tremendous industrial growth and, and immigration that's coming in the United States in the second half of the 1800s and in the early 1900s, you have tremendous growth in the cities. Um, and we're, so with this uh, topic in these three parts, we're going to be talking about, um, um, you know, the growth of cities, but also a tremendous amount of immigration, what life was like for the various economic classes from the, herb, from the upper to the middle to the lower classes. Also, um, unfortunately, the growth of political machines and so forth, and also uh, some cultural and social stuff. So what did uh, people do for recreation? We'll also talk about baseball, my favorite sport. So, um, but this will be divided up into a three-part lecture. Now, so the guy who coined the term Guild Age first uh, was a famous writer that I'm sure that uh, all of you in elementary school have read at least one of his uh, works of literature, and that is Mark Twain. Um, and so what he referred to it as the Gilded Age is he was talking about that the outside is, you know, kind of gilded in the sense that um, it's got uh, wealth and, and prosperity and so forth. But then at the core of it, you have this tremendous poverty um, and slums of, of cities and so forth. And so that's fairly accurate. You have a lot of good that takes place in the Guild Age. Um, and then you also have quite a bit of negative with uh, the slums and the, the unsanitary conditions and the working conditions and, and so forth that uh, took place in the late 1800s. So um, the city at this time is really the center of nation's economic life. Immigrants flooded the cities, making up a third of the residents in 1900 in America's major cities. The millionaires and growing white collar middle class lived in the cities as well, but oftentimes they kind of live a little further out. By 1900, one of, the, one of every five Americans was a city dweller. Nearly 6.5 million inhabited just the top three, New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia. Once steam engines came along, mill operators no longer depended on water-driven power. Railroads enabled entrepreneurs to locate factories at places best situated in relation to suppliers and markets, and not just based on um, their proximity on rivers. Um, iron makers gravitated to Pittsburgh because of its superior access to coal and iron ore fields. So iron ore. Chicago and Cincinnati became the great meatpacking centers of the United States. Factories also created small cities around the plant. Port cities offered abundant cheap labor, you know, like New York and Boston, uh, Baltimore and others. Um, and then with uh, San Francisco and the West Coast as well. Um, each of these cities, including Philadelphia, uh, became hives of small scale labor intensive industrial activity. OK, now New York, though, became huge in garment trade, cigar making and diversified light industry. Not only was New York the nation's largest manufacturing center, it also was known for trade and finance. OK, and so it's pretty incredible what uh, these different cities and so forth and what they kind of specialized in. So at one point in American history, you see you could tell a worker uh, and particularly a child uh, their deformity. Uh, by their occupation. So, for instance, if they were um, uh, had burn marks on them, they were probably in the steel industry, the blast furnaces, having accidents. Um, if they were uh, hunched over um, or had kind of uh, blackened skin, they were probably in the coal mining or iron ore uh, mining business. Um, if they had their fingers that uh, their fingernails were gone and their fingers were kind of wilting away, they were probably in the meatpacking industry. Uh, and there was other industries as well, but um, those particularly stick out. And, uh, it's, it's, it's bad. Um, so Pittsburgh is known for the steel uh, industry. It's Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, later in the 20th century, you're going to see Birmingham and Alabama take off. But right now, steel um, is, is predominantly in the Pittsburgh uh, or at least the western half of Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh kind of was the main hub, but it's really a lot of um, the, the western half of Pennsylvania or yeah, Pennsylvania. OK, unlike Europe, U.S. cities grew beyond their boundaries, forming what the federal census in 1910 began to designate as a metropolitan area. OK, so like suburbs and so forth. U.S. cities began to spread out uh, more so than in Germany, for instance, with only 22 people per acre instead of 150 uh, people per acre like in Germany. Now, let's look at uh, mass transit. So um, typically 
any kind of transportation um, before the late, later uh, half of the 1800s, you know, you, you walked on foot, um, you took a, a steamboat on rivers and, and the ocean uh, or Great Lakes, um, or you traveled by horse or mule or donkey of some sort, uh, by wagon, um, you know, a horse carriage or something like that. But in the latter part of the 1800s, as particularly as railroads came about, they, developed, they put iron tracks for horse-drawn carriages. So you could pay kind of like a bus. Um, as electricity comes about into cities, you began developing electric trolleys. Uh, and they even created elevated trains in 1879, so that way the hustle and bustle could happen on the street level and the elevated trains can travel uh, on the above level. Now, I think one of the coolest mass transit uh, innovations of world history is the subway. Um, and subways are tremendously popular in cities across the world, not just the United States uh, today. But uh, Boston developed the first subway in 1897. And, and my wife, one of her good friends was in her wedding, um, lived in Boston for a number of years. And she didn't even have a car for half the, the time she lived there because she was took the subway for everything. Same way with New York City that, that developed their subway system in, in 1904. Now, this image right here, I love showing this to students because this is a great example of the old world meeting the new. Um, if you look at this image, you, you have skyscrapers, okay, taller buildings, thanks to steel, um, because steel frames allowed those buildings to be supported. Uh, you still don't have skyscrapers out the invention of the elevator, which uh, is one of the most important urban inventions uh, of world history. And then you look right here, you, you see these uh, cables across um, a street, and that's for the electric trolleys. And you can see them across uh, the city. But then you also see horse-drawn carriages and so forth. Uh, and you see people with push carts who are selling things, and you see the hustle and bustle and tons of people. And this is, to me, a great example of the modern age coming about, but yet you still have uh, uh, bits and pieces of the old age still there. And so this is an incredible image to really illustrate the time around the turn of the century. And so, um, man, it was just, it was chaotic. Um, you can imagine those animals uh, pooping all over the place. And so you still have horse manure um, in the streets and um, so forth, but you can see all these different stores and whatnot. Uh, here is an elevated train. New York City developed one in Chicago's, uh, what they call the L is uh, really, uh, one of the, the quintessential things about the city of Chicago um, is a lot, a lot of people take the L and, and you want to try to live uh, within walking distance of the L for if you live in the city. Uh, here's what the Chicago L looks like today. Um, here was uh, what the early subway tunnel looked like and so forth. Really innovative. I mean, incredibly innovative if you think about that. Um, now, this building right here in St. Louis, um, you know, it looks kind of like a boring building today, but this was revolutionary. The Wainwright building in St. Louis was one of the earlier skyscrapers uh, in American history. You can see that it doesn't have near as many floors as skyscrapers do today, but for its age, uh, it was revolutionary. Uh, the Woolworth building in New York City, one of the famous early skyscrapers in American history. Um, you know, that building was at one point the tallest building in the world. Uh, no longer now, but, um, and so forth. Now, one thing I want to emphasize um, about skyscrapers is uh, Chicago pioneered the kind of the construction, but New York took the lead after the mid 1890s. Uh, the 55 story Woolworth building uh, completed in 1913, what I just showed you, marked the beginning of modern Manhattan skyline. Uh, but Chicago had, had uh, um, the Sears Tower and other later, later in their history. All right, for electricity, um, cities had really been lit before electricity by kerosene lanterns and candles. And so like John D. Rockefeller, made his fortune actually making kerosene. Uh, it wasn't until later with the internal combustion engine did um, standard oil really um, become known for making gasoline. Um, and so by the 1870s, electricity be could be generated commercially for city lighting thanks to first Thomas Edison with direct current electricity, but you had to have a power station every block in order to power uh, a building and so forth with direct current. Now, Nikola Tesla developed uh, alternating current electricity. And Edison criticized and said it was too dangerous. Uh, but alternating current electricity is what we use across the globe today. And, and Nikola Tesla proved to be correct and, and Edison proved to be wrong on that. Uh, Charles F. Brush's electric arc lamp soon replaced city lighting because used to you had to have somebody 
on these big stilts, walk around and light the city lights every every evening and then put them back out in the morning. It was actually a, a city job, uh, but electric lighting changed that. Um, and so eventually electric lighting entered the American home. Um, and what, now Edison, even though he was wrong about alternating current electricity, he was spot on by creating the incandescent bulb in 1879, realized that it's cardboard that they can use for that filament um, to keep it from popping and, and eventually last for a while. Um, electricity gave the cities a modern feel, lifting elevators, powering streetcars and subway trains, turning the night into day. Once electricity entered people's homes, the average American went from getting nine hours of sleep to a night to seven because they could stay up and do more things. Alexander, Alexander Graham Bell's telephone in 1876 uh, really eventually is going to replace uh, telegraphs. Um, and it really uh, continued the communications revolution into the uh, second half of the 1800s. So for those who have had me for U.S. History One, we talk about the communication revolution with um, telegraphs and a quicker mail service and then trains and uh, steamboats that allow uh, communication to spread more quickly. Uh, telephones are going to surpass that. And of course, later we're going to see the Internet and, and cell phones uh, even more so. Um, so that's pretty cool. Now, for the urban environment, uh, you can imagine at this time, they literally had to invent uh, trash cans. They literally had to develop trash services. That's one thing that you may you may not uh, realize how important it is. And it's kind of seen as uh, some some point in American society as a tough job with trash collection, but it's an extremely important job for any town, city, rural area to get your trash picked up. Um, because with the Industrial Revolution, they started developing packaging. Before this, you never even had packaging. So if you had any scraps of food, you fed it to your livestock or your dogs. Um, you didn't have packaging to throw away. With the Industrial Revolution, you have that. And so uh, air quality was, was, was terrible. Uh, the poor were the hardest hit by urban growth, as one can imagine. To house everyone, cities like New York constructed apartment buildings called tenements that usually only had one to two air shafts and oftentimes shared communal toilets. Ooh. Um, now, indoor plumbing is going to improve things a little bit, uh, but a lot of these early tenements basically still had outhouses, if you can imagine the aroma coming out of those things. Because many of these structures were poorly built and were a disease waiting to happen, New York passed a tenement housing law of 1901 that required interior courts, indoor toilets, and fire safeguards for new structures. That's where you see like these uh, fire safety ladders and so forth. Um, and then one of the things you did, um, this law does benefit new housing, but it did little for existing housing. With rising land values, landlords saw only high density, cheaply built housing as profitable. Uh, the lung block of New York City was especially horrible for sanitation, sickness, and disease. I call it the lung block because it seemed like everybody was coughing, um, had a coughing fit because of the disease that was there. Cities only later began to utilize urban planners. Nevertheless, people like Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, who designed Central Park, helped design larger park systems, broad boulevards, parkways, zoning laws, and planned suburbs. Uh, one of the, I think, one of the best planned suburban uh, areas I've ever been to is, is Allen, Texas. Uh, the, the zoning is great. The, the roads, um, how they how they built the city, um, you know, laid it out and so forth and residential and commercial and and uh, retail development and, and the streets, uh, the infrastructure and so forth is really well planned out. Well, that's planned out in the last 30 years. Think about um, how you're having to learn from trial and error in the late 1900s, early 1900s. Um, things just developed. And so now city planning is much more efficient, you know, but cities like Houston don't have the best zoning areas. And so you could have a school and then have a liquor store next door. And I'm not saying that that's the case, but you could um, because of the lack of zoning uh, in Houston. But you look at other cities, you know, like uh, Dallas, Texas, you have, uh, you know, strip clubs are in a certain part of the city. Um, you have uh, liquor stores can only be in certain uh, parts of of, of areas and so forth. And because of zoning, you put industrial areas in one area of town, you put residential in another, you put retail in one part of town. And so zoning kind of protects that and so forth. So the lung block, I want to show you a picture here in just a minute of what the lung block looked like. Um, but, you know, when you have tenements, I want to emphasize how overcrowded these things were. Okay. Because of the amounts of immigrants are coming at this time, thousands, um, you know, if you were, say, you know, 
somebody from Bulgaria immigrating or Poland. Um, if you were coming to the United States and you didn't know anybody um, besides some other Bulgarians, then you would might crowd up with your four or five kids in the same one or two bedroom apartment uh, to live until you could kind of make enough money to get your own. And, and, and so these, these, these conditions were overcrowded, um, unsanitary, tough a place to cook your meals, use the restroom, one air shaft that's shared. So one person's getting sick, the whole floor is getting sick. So you constantly have people ill. Um, mass transit eventually can move large uh, numbers of people along fixed routes because before mass transit, you had to live within walking distance of wherever you worked. So if you were at a factory, that's going to leave some crowding, crowded uh, housing nearby. Not to mention, think about the uh, air pollution that those things created. And so um, this is what a dumbbell tenement looked like. This is an improvement. The original tenement was even worse. It didn't have windows. Uh, the dumbbell tenement is an improvement upon the original tenement. And so you had a parlor, living room, and a one-bedroom area. So if you had, you know, uh, three or four families living in, then the living room and parlor was, was jam-packed with, with people sleeping on the floor. And you see the one air shaft and so forth, but at least they had windows. Um, this right here uh, is an image of, uh, I think, illustrates these urban dumbbell tenement areas. You notice all the clotheslines. Uh, that was connected so people could air dry their clothing. But you look at the image on the right, and that is a basic tenement, not even a dumbbell tenement. And um, you can see how, how what a horrible living condition that is. And you also see these apartments are right next to a train track. Think about how loud and noisy. You think they had insulated windows back then? No. Uh, and so water, um, you know, modern plumbing is going to gradually improve throughout the 1800s. Um, as cities uh, implemented infl uh, basically filtration, which I think is, is one of the greatest inventions of world history. Um, uh, you know, if I had to have my pick between air conditioning and modern plumbing, I think I would take modern plumbing. Um, and that's saying something because we love air conditioning in the South. But um, the filtration helps uh, kind of clean up water and so forth. Um, you had manure in the streets from horses, open gutters. Uh, terrible air pollution from the factories, uh, you know, trash collection. Oftentimes people would use the restroom in buckets in their apartments and then chunk it out on the street. Um, and so, you know, um, eventually their cities with taxes are going to be uh, have their own um, um, city departments. And particularly one of those is going to be sanitation. Uh, but it's a, it's a growth in process. You don't start having that immediately in the 1870s. It, it happens um, from city to city over the course of, you know, 20, 30 years developing these things. Crime, um, just like any city, um, is going to have crime problems today. Um, you're going to have crime problems. Uh, oftentimes, uh, those that were struggling to make it would resort to crime. Um, and what's, what's kind of interesting is the, the term giving somebody the third degree. Well, law enforcement sometimes was contracted out. And one even like city law enforcement, you would like uh, have contractor law enforcement officers in the 1800s. And the giving somebody the third degree is they beat them up to uh, get information out of them about other crime. Um, but you had prostitution that was rampant, uh, theft, murder, uh, and so forth. And uh, there were criminals that could be hired to beat somebody up or murder somebody and so forth. You really had hired hitmen at this time. Um, and so a lot of cities were fire hazards. Chicago had a great fire um, around the turn of the century that uh, devastated a large, large chunk of the city because especially for electricity, you have wood houses, candles, or kerosene lanterns, and you knock one over and that can cause a fire. Um, most cities eventually are going to develop full-time fire departments, but originally they were just volunteer or could be hired out. And if they weren't getting paid, then they didn't show up to fire, uh, to, to deal with the fire and so forth. Eventually, uh, fire sprinklers are added to buildings, but that is uh, over time and into the 20th century before that, that comes about. Okay. Now, cities are always going to be on waterways, uh, always closest to raw materials if they can, and also on major transportation routes. Um, and so people came where the jobs were. Uh, people still today move across the United States primarily for job opportunities. Um, and so I've already covered the terrible conditions and so forth that took place. Uh, in part two, I'm gonna cover the um, upper class and middle class lives and so forth. And uh, we'll come back to this in part two.